one. What's up, everyone? We have a really great episode of the show today. We have a special guest, Anthony D'Ambrosio. Everyone, thank you, Anthony, for being here. You All right. I hadn't planned on it, no. Plan on it. Dude, I'm really excited about this episode. <laughs> Minus five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff. How are we, um... You're gonna die. You're good. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. I'm gonna put it on to my shot. Yeah, yeah, come on. Come on. So Kyle, before we start, I just want to make a little announcement that this week, this week's episode of the show is brought to you by, this Hold week's on. episode of the show is brought to you by, um, Drink Studio Coffee. Studio Coffee. Kyle, do you drink a lot of coffee? You know, I've always said that I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. That's a rock hard, stone cold fact. Really? But if I ever did, it would be Studio Coffee. Now you're on the, can you share about your ADHD? You're on the... <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't need coffee because I'm actually on Adderall nowadays. Okay. And, you know, what is coffee if not the poor man's Adderall? That's true. That's true. Uh, so what's that experience been like? Do you feel more productive? I mean, yeah, I do feel more productive. I also have a lower appetite, so I do project myself losing weight in the near future, which I'm pretty pumped for. Some people think of it as like a negative thing, you know, decreased appetite, but I think it's a real win in my life. Cool. All right, man. Well, Anthony, thanks for being here. You got your mic right here. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, oh, how have like things a been? a button there. So you're in, um, where do you live now? Denver. Denver, Denver yeah, now. Catholic Mecca. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Is it good there? It's, you know, the cold showers there are especially, especially awesome. Oh, you've been taking cold showers. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the way, man. Just do for the dopamine. Wait, Kyle, Kyle did you ever do this before where you took cold showers? I, I did it for Lent one time when I was in high school, but my mom actually made me quit the cold showers because I was smelling really bad because I wasn't really scrubbing very well. Mm. Um, so that was tough. Yeah, I did one one Lent. I actually did, um, I don't know if I've told you this story yet, Anthony, but like one Lent, I tried doing the cold shower thing. I got pretty deep into it. Um, but then I realized you're supposed to do the entire shower cold. Do you do the whole shower cold, Kyle, or just like the the ending? Because Nick, my friend Nick, told me that I was I was a, a fake because I wasn't doing the entire shower cold. Yeah, doing the end cold that's like a James Bond thing. Like Sean Connery would do that in like the Bond movies. I was trying to do the whole thing. Wait, why would cold. he do that in the Bond movies? It's like a thing. It like wakes your body up, and you can just like see him in some. You know, it's the Bond movies. They have these shower scenes, and he's like turning it cold right at the just end. Just to wake yourself up. It's like it wakes you up. It like gets you ready. It's like the softer version. But I think it's still like a version. But if you're doing like Exodus, you got to do the whole thing. Okay, and then uh, what's like the worst? What's like the worst thing you've ever done for Lent? Dude, the cold shower thing was tough. Uh, when I was in college, I also gave up making out with my girlfriend one time. That was pretty funny. Wait, what? Yeah, we uh, we kissed one time a day. That was like the idea. I think you're just supposed to give up making out with your girlfriend in general. Yeah, I know, but you know, I was trying to do it for Lent. Giving up a sin for Lent's always kind of weird, but you do what yeah, you can. It's important. Yeah. Well, enough of all that crap. Mm -hmm. Anthony, you have a lot of big things going on in your life. Um, Single. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I meant projects, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't watch. know which one. I'm really excited to talk about the film. So maybe we talk about the the book and the subscription first. Okay. So you launched a children's book. I did launch a children's book. Okay. I, I wrote a children's book called Beekle and the Star Stone, which is a playful retelling of the parable of the Pearl of Great Price or the Buried Treasure. Yeah. Uh, but with... Birds on a jungle island. Yeah. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Pearl by by John Stein by Steinbeck. Did Steinbeck write the Pearl? Yeah, this is uh this Different. is a little more adapted for uh bedtime. <laughs> for yeah. yeah. How did you come up with the name Beagle? I think the name Beagle's very fun. Oh, it's a really I mean it's a great name for a boy bird, don't you think? I <laughs> completely agree. <laughs> yeah, Kyle, what the crap? I said, Dude, how did he come up with it? Because I liked it. It was a compliment. Dude, I'm not liking your tone today, Kyle. <laughs> uh, like yeah. Anyways, um, so for people that don't, just quick history of you. I think a lot of people know you who watch my show, but like quick history of agency. Just like give me the trajectory up until like we should write and launch a children's book. Yeah. So I was doing youth ministry and was, as one does, getting burnt out and wondering what was next. Uh, we connected. We uh, came together and we made Catholic Creatives happen. 
uh, launched that off and then ended up managing that while running a creative firm that really used storytelling and branding to build, uh, help communities that were trying to build really deep spiritual kind of movements, mm. uh, help them to launch. So that was kind of the bread and butter. And while we were doing that, uh, we were working with lots and lots of churches. And as you know, it, it can be a little bit, uh, I don't want to say can I say soul crushing? You can say whatever you want. Yeah, it can be a little soul crushing, uh, waiting in there and lots of you know lots of das and kind of conversations that that go uh, something to the tune of like, do you have insurance for this or like whatever. <laughs> so anyway, while we're doing that, um, we decided that as a team we wanted to do something much more fun that was more direct to consumer. like families. Yeah, you know, yeah, just like I mean, direct to consumer, but it's like at the direct end of the to day, people, direct to people. Yeah, at the end of the day like what we're trying to do in helping the church is to help ultimately families to be uh, stronger. Yep. And so uh, being able to like, Hey, we're going to help a family directly through making this amazing, magnificent, like playful bedtime experience for yeah. families to, to have. And we're like, we're going to design a children's book, but we're going to like UX this, you know, yeah. we're going to come up with all of the ways that we could make this like particularly impactful um, as a, almost like a script for bedtime. So did you, did your family read, like, did you get read stories growing up? Yeah, I did very, uh, we, we did, but here's the problem that I found in my family was that as soon as there was more than I'm from a family of five. And as soon as there was more than like two kids, you know, my brother and I and, and our sister, uh, we, there was too much of a spread in the for age. all of us to oh, yeah, 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 enjoy yeah. the same stories. So then like the little kids would get, you know, something that was rather boring and the older kids would kind of run off to their rooms and yeah. read their own stuff. Um, and I wanted to come up with a way that would like preserve that familial bedtime experience for much longer, hmm. uh, that could embrace both younger kids, uh, but that also had that sort of story, um, complexity that that brings older kids to the table and gives them a real moral that that they can uh kind of eat yeah i have that same problem with uh with movies because like <clears throat> my youngest is four the oldest is 10 it's mm -hmm. like i guess we're all just gonna watch avengers and my four-year-old is gonna watch loki get strangled yeah, <laughs> yeah. like it's just gonna happen it's just gonna it makes me a bad parent mm -hmm. do you have do you have uh children's books that stand out to you that that you really like there uh and i'll go first thanks for asking uh yeah the got it. weight of a mass uh, is yeah. a really fantastic one. It's a really good one. Uh, but do you have other ones where you're like, oh, this is this is like what I'm aiming for, something like that, or just that influenced you? Uh, actually, The Little Prince was one that yeah. really influenced me because it's obviously written for kids, but it's got this incredibly playful uh, thing throughout, and it's a ch uh, chapter book. So yeah. it's this book in a way that's really written for adults, but that children also can grasp onto it's super universal yeah. and i was really trying to hit something like that when yeah. i wrote people that's a good one kyle did your parents read you books growing up or yeah read you stories or bedtime stories or? yeah they uh they they did and for me it was where the wild things are something oh, about yeah, that yeah. book and i've read it to my nephew a bunch of times and it's just something so fantastical about the world they created that i think is really cool and i think I, it holds up well I've always, and I've thought about this a lot. I've all, I always have like a very, like the act of an adult or the act of a person holding up a book and reading and like the pauses and the, this sounds really weird, but like almost like the ASMR of like an adult, like flipping the page and stuff. I don't know why, but that's always been like really satisfying. Even yeah. when I'm doing it to my kids, like mm -hmm. there's something about like the pausing, the turning and like the whole experience is that that's really cool. Um, anyways, I just thought I'd share that. Yeah, like one of the things that I did was we put a QR code on the back that you can use to turn on like jungle noises oh, that's cool. while you're like reading. So things like that that make something an immersive experience. It's like this really puts you like many dad points above yeah. the rest when you're uh, reading to, to your, your kids with, and putting in that extra energy to make it immersive. Yeah. Um, and making questions and answers and little like back and forths that are written into the book. Uh, those things I think help a lot to make a bedtime reading experience feel like it's a, you know, a loving connection between the reader and the children. So yeah. we so decided to write all of that in to make it easier. And who wrote it? Like who did you write I wrote, the story? I wrote it. Yeah, I wrote Sweet. it. And then uh, we all kind of edited it and illustrated it together. Yeah. And then you workshopped it too. Cause I remember you're looking for people to 
like to uh, almost have a focus group on it. Yeah. What was that experience like? It was really fun. Uh, beta testing children's books is really like, <laughs> it's, it's the children are like the best beta testers. Yeah. Ever, you know what yeah. I mean? They just like, you know exactly when they lose their attention and yeah. like all of that. I, I think it's actually really great. Like it, if I could recommend anything to priests, it would be like if, if kids are being squirmy during your homilies, like they're just the ones that are being honest, mm. you know? Uh, so watch them. And yeah. if, if you've got them, then you're good. And if you don't have them, then like you need to change. The Were way there the any significant is. edits that happened? Like, oh after? yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, one was like, we just had to cut out many, many pages. Okay. Um, we had to really compress it down and, uh, that's always part of like the, the process of editing. But. That's great. I mm -hmm. wonder how many books get focus tested like that or like products. Get I don't think many. Yeah. Cause like when you well, think products of, for sure, but not yeah. books. Cause when you think of, yeah, but yeah, because that's crazy. Cause if you think about what you would have published, had you not done the focus group, there's like substantial changes. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. wild to think about. Man. Now I'm thinking like, what other things? Cause like when I think of a focus group, I think normally I just think like, oh, that's what like Coca-Cola does or something. Right. Yeah. Was, was there like a scientific approach to it or was it more just intuitive? Like I, I read it. I know where the, the beats were that need to change kind of thing. Yeah. I, I there wasn't necessarily something scientific about it. Uh, we did multiple, but each one was, there's a very clear intuitive, like here's the places where kids are getting squirmy or, yeah. uh, Oh, like if we want this to really be usable for bedtime, like it's got to move more quickly for, and for parent to make it easier for parents to, to use. Uh, and all of the chapters have to be pretty much like exactly the same proportionally. So things like that, that we were like yeah. really noticing as we were going through it. Like that's that. cool. Yeah. What about the illustrations? Who did the illustrations? Yeah, that was a uh, Connor Henley. Who's yeah. one of the other guys in the Sherwood fellows team. Uh, he was just, we would get together and we would sketch out, uh, sketch it out. It was kind of like, doing storyboards for a film, uh, which is something we would do a lot for commercials and stuff, but then he would actually color them in. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's beautiful. So what's the website? Yeah. The website is Beagle and the starstone.com. Nice. If you want to check it out and get one and, uh, do a reading with your, your children. Um, and then take us to the lion and the lamb or lion and lamb book club. Yes. The lion and the lamb <laughs> uh, is Jesus uh, and slightly beneath Jesus is this book club. <laughs> yeah. For... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, as, as part of the whole kind of movement towards uh, families, I joined up with a company uh, called Catholic Ventures that actually sort of brought in uh, Catholic creatives into the fold during the pandemic and they decided to fund it and all of that. So while I was getting to know them through that sale, we decided to work together on launching some new products. And one of them is this uh, Catholic Kids Book Club that's just uh, wholesome books for Catholic families based on ages. That's and cool. uh, you can also get Beacle and the Starstone through subscribing for this book club. But it comes along with uh, these. One of the things we did with Beacle that was really interesting was uh, we made this experience box that had discussion questions for parents and these other sort of experiential goodies that would come with it. And everything that we heard about it from parents that used it was like, oh, this was so awesome. You know, mm -hmm. we made it so much more immersive and really fun. And uh, so anyway, we we're like, what could we do to make that kind of experience more easily accessible. Yeah. And uh, we decided to curate all these books. And one of the other things is just that it's so hard to find wholesome books now. Uh, mm -hmm. You just have to, yeah, you can't just go to the public library or like go to most like book lists that are out there online because there's so much political kind of ideological indoctrination that's going on that. Yeah. And it's not there. like, it's not like they say it in yeah. the, in the description, like, yeah. Hey, on page nine, we threw this in there. Yeah. There's like a, the boys kiss each other. Yeah. Like, well, uh, yeah, exactly. What? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's all this stuff that's just kind of like seeping in that I think parents are really nervous about and, um, to just know, okay, I'm going to get a steady stream of books that my kids are going to be really entertained with, but that yeah. are not going to be, uh, like driven ideologically in any direction. Um, I think is really comforting and saves a lot of time. So how often do you get the boxes? Yeah, so they're quarterly kind of seasonal boxes cool. and that they have themes that go along with the seasons and help you to sort of create a more liturgical cycle in your own family with it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and there will be three to five books for each box depending on hardcover and how big they are and how much yeah. 
Yeah. It's so interesting. Like I'm seeing with my kids how important a lot of like fantasy is because it like it bleeds over into everything else. So we watch a lot of the Avengers and then um, Lord of the Rings. We've kind of watched pretty much. And then I've read some of Lord of the Rings. And it's funny how like like contextually something will happen and then it'll be related back yeah. to those stories. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's so cool. Like, like I forget sometimes how important it is, especially for younger kids to, to have like the fantasies and the stories for their like ethical development or their moral development or virtues and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it really is our, like our underlying operating system. You mm-hmm. know, if you want to develop a kid's more sense of morality, like that, the operating system is the the myths and stories and parables that you give them and feed them. And uh, oh yeah, it's a lost art for us. I think one of the really sad things about the whole way that we're trying to drive ideological kind of messages and political messages into kids' brains is that like stories, those stories suck. They just mm-hmm. are boring yeah. when you try to do that. But um, old, really like meaty kind of moral things that have to, that, that really are human, like those sorts of questions that stories that deal with those things, the kids just like need them. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So when, so you're alluding a little bit to, uh, what is it? Joseph Campbell mm. and like yeah. Jung, you're like yeah, into that stuff, into right? Yeah. yeah. Super into it. And so like, I don't know for people that don't know that kind of stuff, which Campbell's like that all myths, uh, kind of lead, like there's these archetypes and, myths kind of there's many different types of myths but there's really kind of one or two am i saying this right like what was the yeah uh i think ultimately all you need to know is that there are deep stories that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation in our history uh as a race and as a species and those stories have evolved along with us and we've evolved along with them in such a way that they speak almost biologically mm. to us. And these sorts of archetypes are, uh, you know, there's the hero's journey that people talk about a lot. There's like this kind of Gandalf figure, if you will. Yeah. Um, these like are a mentor or sage. Yeah, and like, like, I think one of the things that's really amazing about, you know, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings is they've nailed these archetypal figures mm. and have told stories that, that stay very true to those sort of archetypal morals. Like, um, the sort of kid from a country town who is uncommon or yeah, in any, in any, every way he's a common person, but yeah. has an uncommon destiny and then has to learn some sort of profound lessons about life in order to overcome the evil forces that would otherwise be oppressing his people. Like that is a journey that we see in so many different, uh, stories, but, and like uh, the call to adventure, yeah, the call to, all, of, it, all yeah. of these things. So if you, uh, if you, Basically, archetypal figures, archetypal symbols, archetypal stories uh, are plugging into some of these deep, long-held, uh, yeah, images and and meanings and morals that have helped the human race to survive by uh, teaching us virtues. Yeah. How do you process that with, uh, or or what do you make of someone that looks there? There's like two ways to look at that. One is that these things are all made up or another one is like, they're based in like a, like an objective reality. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. What do you make of that? Like, I I think about that a lot. Like, do, are we just making, are we making these things up because they're true or are we making these things up because biologically it's just happens to be that way? You know, like, I mean, as, as like a Christian, I want to, I want to believe that we are making these, that there are these archetypes because it's true, because there's something true there that like every human person is called, to an adventure that there are sages we can look like, I don't know. Does that make sense? As opposed to um, some people, maybe a materialist view, like a scientific view is like, well, this is just things we made up to kind of hold our social structure in order. And like, just so that we don't rob each other. And, and we just collectively like, I don't know, honor these virtues and stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, it is very clear that, life prefers love and collaboration Mm. like that somehow love as a force that's that works through even biology to overcome death and darkness and suffering that is uh it's a story that's so deeply built into the foundation of the world Mm. that 
regardless of whether the human species was here making things up, uh, is very true. Yeah. It's just a truth. Like, you know, you even look at the structure of a cell, right? That uh, you need this DNA that's entwined. And uh, in order for like a cell to reproduce, uh, it has to, uh, well, yeah, it, the fact that a cell can reproduce is just an amazing thing, yeah. right? And uh, in order to beat darkness and death, it doesn't become in, in and of itself something that is uh, invulnerable or immortal. It passes its life on mm. uh, in some sort of like, I'm giving myself to the next uh, generation. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is all sort of amoral. It's not done consciously, but it's built into the very mechanisms of life. Yeah. And I think that if you zoom out a lot of our stories, even the story of Christ is very much like the story of that cell. It's mm. like a story of, of self gift in order to kind of feed the rest of the world and to, uh, to bring it to life. And so anyway, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a good answer, but no, I that's really great. I really mean, when you start with a, when you started with the, when you started with this book, did you start with just the idea of a story, or did you start with the idea of a of a principle or moral that you were trying to write about? Yeah, I started with the principle and a moral. I'm I think that as a kid, I was <laughs> I was really like I would struggle a lot with Christianity feel, feeling very dark, yeah. and I think one of the struggles of my adulthood in general has been to let go of a shame-based uh sort of discipline heavy mm. uh sacrifice-based catholic worldview yeah and i think the parable of the pearl of great price or the treasure in the field is very interesting in that regard because it's yeah. completely the opposite tonally like mm. it's this kind of playful prank on the world yeah. that Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is. It's all, every sacrifice that you make as a Christian is like the man who goes and uh, knows that he's got this treasure buried in the field and that he's selling everything he has joyfully in order to get it because yeah. it's going to be way better. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that kind of playful way of approaching faith, I think, is something I aspire to, but also something that I want to correct in the way that I would raise uh, my own children or influence uh, nieces and nephews and godchildren. So yeah. that was kind of how I like approached it. That's awesome. What was like? What was the biggest thing you learned? Have you have you written stories like this before? Like, do you write? I mean, I know you write uh, poetry. But, like, is this the first in this genre? Like, have you ever tried this before? Uh, first in the genre, but it's yeah. all kind of the same. Like, even working on commercials or marketing campaigns, it really all is like, who am I speaking to? What am I trying to say to them? Mm -hmm. And then, like, what are the sort of you know, story beats that, that show the, the struggle or the journey through that moral lesson. Yeah. And, uh, I think, yeah, it was a very harrowing experience, honestly, doing the editing and letting go of like the darlings and really ultimately I was writing in the public library, uh, finishing it. And there was a certain moment where I kind of like found the whole thread and the core of like what I was trying to say in the editing process. And I just started like weeping, sobbing uncontrollably, you know, like this is something that's so deep to my heart and to my own experience. So yeah, I, uh, that's I, awesome. Not, I mean, maybe talk more about that. Cause not a lot of people, a lot of people think that you write to just write down what you think, mm -hmm. but there's this idea that you write to find out what you think, like yeah. that the practice of writing, like you have a general idea of what mm -hmm. you think, but when you write it down, you kind of discover what you think and believe. Yeah. Or more deeply, mm. you know, there's like a general sort of I'm heading in this direction. I kind of have this idea. But then when you really get into it, you you realize how uh, God uses the journey of art making and the creative process to really form you on the inside. It's kind of like what everybody says. It's like you, if you want to really learn something, teach it. Uh, you can learn it this deep. And then when you actually have to create around it, you have to go down to like many, many, many levels yeah. below that. Uh, let's now transition speaking of that to the film yeah. the feature film that you're or describe it for people yeah so i'm working on a feature-length film about maximilian colby um toying around with some different titles but the passion of colby is one uh and the idea being that colby in his kind of final days i've heard the story of colby told many times where he makes this very heroic sacrifice right and he's 
called out into roll call. There's a prisoner that has escaped, and now they are condemning 10 men at random to die. And he trades his life for one of the other men who's condemned to death. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. But uh, again, it almost feels a little bit like dour and dark. Mm. In I mean, of course, the whole story is dark. But just the fact of like heroism is me trading my life so that another man can live mm. and I die so he can live. It's like, I don't know. Honestly, if that's Christianity, like, fuck that. <laughs> um, so <Damn. laughs> Anthony coming in hot. We're freaking 30, 40 minutes in and Anthony comes in hot. Wait, is so say more. Hot? So the idea of like at needing to lay down your, or, or the idea that, uh, Hey, this is what Christianity is. Kids like, you need to just die for other people. Right, yeah. I think that that's like actually a really destructive thing mm -hmm. to teach children. Yeah, yeah. Um, That it, somebody, is el somebody else's life is just much more valuable than your own life. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do think sacrifice is really important. But again, going back to the, uh, the parable of the Pearl of Great Price, there's this like, you are getting something beautiful out of it that mm. you want more than that, mm. than just the other person being alive. So it's kind of like you're missing, you're missing why St. Ma like you're missing that St. Maximilian Colby was focused on the pearl. Yeah. Like you're kind of missing that in like, like we just focus on the, the reality, like, or if you, you could tell the story in a way where it's like this guy needed to die, this other guy died for him. And then that was, it's it. just a trade. It's yeah. a one-to-one -one trade. Yeah, yeah. And there's not like a, uh, there's, <laughs> there's not profit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but like to St. Maximilian Colby, like maybe to stretch the analogy too far, but like, to say Maximilian Colby, that action was selling everything to get the pearl, right? In a way, and uh, but I think like describing what the pearl was is a really big part of yeah, what I am yeah. hoping to do with yeah. the with this movie. In that, we have to recognize that Poland has always been a country that has been oppressed mm -hmm. and invaded, uh, and where the oppressors have actively tried to rip out the core identity of that kind of which is catholicism they've been trying to rip that out of poland for yeah. a thousand years yeah and more than that <clears throat> so colby is a very polish person and he's in this place where um the nazis are literally trying to rip the spirit and the soul out of poland like this is very early in the war they've overcome everything very quickly it looks like a completely unstoppable destructive force yeah that uh, is going to win and going to overcome and be become the new sort of empire, if you mm -hmm. will. And the first thing that they're trying to do in Poland is to destroy the whole underlying, undergirding spirituality of the whole place, right? Like Polish brotherhood is very deep and very strong. It's part of how they grit through everything. Mm. And so if you look at the way that they're punishing them or trying to deter them from escaping... It's like this one man escaped and in doing so, he knew that he was condemning 10 of you to death. Mm. So they're saying, in a way, ultimately, all of you guys are out for yourselves. There is no real brotherhood in Poland left. Yeah. And when Colby set, steps out of line to kind of confront the commandant, what he's doing is this kind of like catalytic... Uh, resist spiritual resistance against that lie that they are trying to uh bring into all like basically just like they're trying to destroy the whole worldview of the polish people yeah uh with very demonic lies mm. and so his act was an act that that really was trying to restore the brotherhood of poland mm. and when he stepped into the cell then he was ministering to these men for 14 days and if I was in that cell and I was in Auschwitz, I think that the first thing that I would have wanted to do, well, what, what would you have wanted to do? When I, if like, if, if I was knew, one of those guys, yeah, you're in the cell and you know that you're just going to be there until you die. Right. The first thing I would do, man, establish a strong pea corner. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm not sure. You know, I've thought so much about, I remember the, I still remember, have a very vivid memory of the first time I heard this story mm -hmm. from a priest telling the story in a homily. And I was a little, little kid and we were in Europe. I don't, we weren't in Poland or maybe we were, I don't know. We were somewhere in Europe. I remember uh, this priest telling the story and I was just like enraptured by the story. Like yeah. it just seemed so intense and so crazy. 
And um, I've, I've thought a lot about, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Kyle, what would you do? First well, thing, like. I think it's an impossible question because it's very easy to th- say in a warm podcast studio, well, I would do X, right? But the obvious aside of if I'm in the cell with Colby, I want to go to confession. I want to get that taken care of. Oh, that's true. You know there's a priest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, you know there's a priest. That probably would be definitely so the first thing. I'm knocking that out. And honestly, at that point, if I'm in Auschwitz, I'm ready to go, right? It's It doesn't matter if you're not ready or not. The clock is ticking. It's the death camp, right? And bearing extraordinary circumstances, you're you're gone. And one member of my family got out of there, and it's not. I don't think I'm going to make it too statistically speaking. So I think I'd go to confession and just be ready to ready to die yeah and like honestly which is very easy to say for the record it's very easy to say oh i wouldn't beg for my life when i'm here yeah but and and honestly did not get super dark but i think i would i would just be like man most of this is going to be mental like mental like anguish as you just starve and like i mean honestly i'd i'd probably like try to just like i mean one pray but also just like meditate and Mm -hmm. like like trying to just like this is going to be an extremely emotional uh and could get really really bad like because you're in there with other people it's not like you're just starving the cell by yourself like like this could get rough and yeah. like wanting to do everything in my power to like guard against like the emotional like deterioration you right. know yeah i i i think that a lot of people if they were really really honest would say like if there was a way to take an out i would just take the Take the easiest off. Out? Yeah, like if I oh, could yeah, commit suicide. Would, yeah, like, the thought would cross would, your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, like I would, I would, I know that there's no point, like I'm not going to be doing much for anybody by staying alive. Mm. Uh, I think that a lot of people would just try and commit suicide if they could. Yeah. And that clearly was what the Nazis were expecting and what they were pushing people to do. I mean, one of the ways that they would intro people into the, like, into Auschwitz itself would be like, hey, here's the electric fence. If you want to take it out at any point, go ahead and throw yourself against it and you'll die immediately. Jeez, that was like, I didn't know that. That was like, hey, welcome <clears throat> everybody. Here's the electric fence. You that can will kill, kill yourself. You. Yeah. And people would do it regularly. So people would watch other people like run up and, you know, throw themselves on the electric fence and kill themselves. So Dang, they were, that is they were wild. really promoting like, kill yourself, kill each other, every man for themselves, steal food from each other. Like they were trying to just completely destroy any sense of humanity Mm. that was present. So what Colby is doing is preserving the human soul of Poland and standing against that kind of oppressive spirit by ministering to these men. And if they were able, they survived, he survived 14 days, but the normal life expectancy in one of these cells of starvation would have been two or three days, right? Mm. So they're singing songs and hymns and anthems that are being heard by other people in the cells. And these cells are beginning to sing with them and it's becoming a routine. And so all of these people who are walking outside of this prison cell uh, are now saying like, it sounds like a a chapel. It sounds like Mm. a place of prayer, which of course was outlawed in Auschwitz. So the only place where people were free to make a religious sort of pilgrimage or have a religious experience would have been uh, within earshot of this, you know, this, uh, this cell. So I think what they were doing uh, was not just what Colby was doing is not just saving this one man. He was saving like the soul of Poland and having a massive impact on all of the people who were in Auschwitz at the time. Yeah. It's interesting that, like the idea of the cell, like you know you're gonna die, but that's not very much different than our lives. Like I know right. I'm gonna die. Like I was just as you were telling that story, I was like, man, that's really. It's almost like it's almost like in a way, not to get theologically like inaccurate, but like in a way, like they all became priests in the sense that like what they were doing, like transformed this suffering and transformed this into something that was like, like changing the atmosphere of the place. And yeah. But then I was like, but then immediately I'm like, well, we're all going to die. Like, right. like what is it about it, the imminence of the death as opposed to like, like I know I'm going to die. Why, why? I don't know. It's I strange. Think it, I think it's a really good point because for me, that's been a, I go to this story to deal with my own fear of death and mm. with my own fear of suffering. And I think that Colby's example is like, it is a modern Christian uh 
yeah, Christological story. It yeah. renders Christ's story in a way that's like in modern trappings to a way that I can really understand. Yeah. I think it's really beautiful. Why why was the uh life expectancy two to three days? Because I've I've gone three days without eating. Uh they didn't get water either. Oh, okay. So they would have had to really fight in some way to stay alive. Gotcha. I was wondering if maybe like they just ended up like I don't know, killing each other and stuff normally or uh that cannibalism was also a thing. Yeah. No. Um I remember now that I actually have you you visited the cell in the yeah I remember yeah I just was there I remember being there yeah mm-hmm. that was pretty crazy Kyle did you get to go to Poland no nah, I never went to Austria it's it's worth it's worth it it was pretty cool there's a there's a quote on the pitch deck that you shared with me uh, something about someone saying that the cell got turned into a cathedral mm-hmm. who is that by and like what was the context there was a there's a janitor who's really the eyewitness to all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a, also sort of a member, a prisoner of Auschwitz, but they would give, uh, I mean, part of the whole thing was they, they gave each, gave all of them chores that helped to make each other's lives worse. You know what I mean? So uh, there was this one uh, janitor that was sort of taking care of the cell and he would be present every time they would go in to take a body out, um, that kind of thing. Mm. And so he just had really beautiful things to share about mm. the story. Yeah. And then... Uh, Share some of the stuff that's unique about the film because uh, other Christian films have to have huge budgets because they're a period piece, but you have a little bit of a unique take on the on the set and the yeah. So one of the reasons why I think we don't see many Catholic stories about saints coming out, uh, which in and of itself is really I think a crippling thing for us because media is so important. Like I was sharing before, stories really tell. Like they become the underpinning way that we navigate the world. And if we don't have really good stories to share about our saints to our children, like we're impoverishing them of, uh, yeah, of a sense of moral navigation. So anyway, this, the, pr- the difficulty though is economic that movies take a lot of money to make. Mm. And if we want to tell saint stories in particular, these are history pieces and period dramas and, Hollywood speak, that means expensive as hell yeah. Uh, yeah. because you have to like recreate a whole world yeah. and all of these sets are huge. The costumes are expensive. You know, the sweeping thing over the town, it's like that one shot panning over the town is like a million dollars or more. You yeah. Know? There's going to so, be a lot of horses. Right. Involved. Yeah. 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 Rent, you, who, who do you rent horses from? <laughs> who do you rent like the, you know, the like 1920s car that's like driving down yeah. all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very expensive. So, uh, I think that when I was thinking about oh, how would I make a movie that was tellable, uh, but that didn't cost like $16 million to make, uh, I thought there's a lot of drama in Colby's story just inside of the conversations he's having with the other men mm. that he's stuck inside the cell with. Like what would they have been talking about for those 14 days? Yeah. Um, and I honestly was like, wow, that I would be, I would watch that. Movie. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so the idea is this is sort of like Passion of the Christ meets 12 Angry Men, where uh, in a lot of ways, like life itself is on trial. Should we stay alive? Uh, Wait, should, pull up 12 Angry Men. What, what's remember very, that very movie? famous movie. By is this the one where they're uh, the jury? Yeah. yeah it's okay. like a jury stuck yeah. in, in one room. Yeah. And yeah. yeah there's just really high stakes because they have to decide whether or not this kid dies. And there's one man who's kind of saying, Hey, let's not kill him. I think that he's innocent. And wow, man. Yeah. There are a lot of like connections breaks the down until all of them kind of come onto his side. Yeah. And so in this film, it's like Colby is the one man saying, let's not kill ourselves. Let's stay alive uh, for the sake of the camp as long as we can. Yeah. And, uh, our lives can mean something still, even though we're in this like place of suffering. And eventually all of the men kind of come on board with him to, to this sort of spiritual resistance against the Nazis. Did you do much research into this movie or like, did this influence it much? Oh yeah, just- for sure. I, I think after watching it many times, I, I thought, uh, it's genius because you're seeing so you're getting to know men, you know, and it's super dramatic, but yeah. it's all in this very tight kind of claustrophobic uh, place. And all of that actually makes it even more interesting. Yeah. So uh, I think that personally, 
someone that enjoys really good conversations and uh, group dynamics and things yeah. like that. Like, I think it's really interesting to to watch a group of people try and figure out a problem together. And uh, so, yeah, movies like this well, really it, influence me. And what it's an interesting constraint because, especially in a world where we have, like, Avengers and Marvel and there's so much CGI, what can you show and all this stuff, it's almost, it's almost more uh, impactful when you when you don't show something, it's mm -hmm. almost more impactful. To like you, your like your imagination's having to uh, to kind of fill in what's happening outside the cell, what's happening in these other places. Like people are talking about things. There's almost more terror and more like I don't know. There's like a bigger impact where you show less mm. in some situations. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely plenty of plays. I mean, Shakespeare is a good example of this, where like a lot of the battles are all happening off screen, and the characters are really talking about them. But what's really beautiful about that is that like when you're hearing somebody tell the story of something that's happening outside, you're learning about the plot, but you're also getting to see, getting to know the characters. Yeah. It's like where story happens is yeah. how does a person transform when they make certain decisions and take certain risks uh, towards either darkness or towards the light. Yeah. And uh, I think those kinds of questions and those sorts of journeys um, can become can be brought even more into relief when you have a very simple set and it's not plot. It's like these people having to make these sorts of life and death decisions. So how many total actors? Uh, there will be more. P there's more scenes than okay, just okay. that spot, but there's ten men that get thrown in the in the cell. Okay. So those ten men plus the the Nazi commandant and the the janitor and a few sh sort of Roman soldiers, if you yep. will, kind of thing. So um, what, what state do you already have actors and stuff picked out? Like what stage of the process are you in? No, we finished the script. Um, oh, nice. And wow. It's in development, meaning right now uh, I'm pitching investors looking for people who kind of want to participate in funding the, the first sort of half. Well, uh, 250K is what we need to actually get started shooting and then another 250K for the marketing. Yeah. Um, and so once we get the 250, then we'll start shooting. Uh, and hopefully that will be sometime in uh, the spring or the summer. Dang. So the script is like finalized? Uh, it, you know, script is never final. Even, That's true. That's true. Even when you're shooting, like the actors, at least in the way that I like to direct, the the actors get to really know the characters and they get to say, I wouldn't say it this way, you mm -hmm. know, and that actually can lend even more like, you know, organic yeah. uh, naturalism to the script. But uh, it's at a point now where it's shootable. Like, I think that if we shot it right now, it would be very successful. It's just uh, there's probably more things to cut, more things to get, like to do more efficiently, perhaps whenever we get all the locations. And we're like, oh, well, we don't have a British... Uh, 1920s sort of like villa right next to a like concentration camp outside look so we're gonna have to like you know rewrite the scene in order to yeah to make it fit deal with what we have here that kind of thing yeah so, kyle uh, you had a question earlier i was say what other movies inspired you right because it's really easy to say like we're gonna make a movie like the passion and 12 angry men like two of the most influential movies ever and but i really like asking people what are the things that inspire you that maybe weren't as like top 100 movies of all time right because then you can get a little bit of a different picture of what you were interested in have you seen 127 hours yeah it's the arm movie right yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the arm, arm movie exactly where he has to cut off his own arm yeah. yeah so he's like stuck in a small small space and he's sort of in a life or death survival kind of struggle yeah uh and through that whole time he's having flashbacks to memories uh as he gets more and more like uh, deprived of hunger and sleep, like things become more surreal. And yeah. ultimately he has to like to overcome his really deepest character flaw, uh, which is he loves being alone and doesn't care about being with people. Like mm. he has to cut off his own arm in order to like go and be with people, I guess. Yeah. And it's a really powerful inner journey, but very, very simple movie with a simple set. So yeah, that's like, uh, there's one with Ryan, Ryan Reynolds where he's buried in a Ooh. coffin uh, and like the whole the whole thing is just shot basically different angles of this coffin i haven't seen that one what's this called what look is. this up kyle uh just <laughs> google ryan reynolds buried in a coffin <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds really good yeah it's called yeah called buried duh mm -hmm. i should have remember that yeah and then they talked about like like scroll down just a little bit so they made all these different interesting like 
like not exactly real sets for this coffin. So like sometimes the coffin feels uh, like it's very, very deep. So they built like wood walls that go up really, really high, even though he's in the little size of a coffin or they had to fill, they had to like create all these different sets to, to do these different types of angles, but it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another one that I think is real interesting is uh clerks. You guys know clerks, the movie mm -mm, yeah. so clerks is uh, it's like Kevin Smith. You know, what Kevin Smith is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like the movie that put him on the scene, right? It's you know, one of the b best comedy movies ever. And he shot it. It's in black and white, but it's from the nineties. And I, you know, I'd heard the movie's great. So I gave it a watch and it is, it's spectacular. It essentially takes place almost entirely at this convenience store. This guy and his buddy are clerks, right? And it's, they go out, but it's pretty much only there, but it's black and white. And I liked the movie, and I had to reevaluate some things about myself. Because I was like, man, am I a guy who likes black and white movies? Like, that's not good for me. <laughs> I have to reevaluate like, my I don't want to be that kind of guy. My whole thing, my whole vibe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I felt better upon finding out that it wasn't an artistic choice as much as the budget for the movie. It was in the 90s, I think. So it was, it was like 2500 bucks. It was nothing. Maybe even less than that. And they couldn't afford to grade the colors. So they just shot it in black and white. Not to be artsy, but just... Because it's easier, because you don't need to worry as much about your color grade, which makes some sense to me. But it was just spectacular. It sent this guy to lifetime fame. And I think that that's interesting, because I don't know anything about the backstory of 12 Angry Men, right? Was 12 Angry Men shot there because they had the idea? Or was it this natural sort of organic, I want to make a movie, I've got a great story, I don't have a lot of money. And I also don't know which one's cooler, because there's mm -hmm. something to be said for that grassroots spirit I love. There's also something cool to be said about, you know, I have the budget, but I'm still going to constrain myself because that's what the art requires. I think it's all very interesting. Well, it was written as a radio show. First. Really? Interesting. So it was what adapted, was? 12 Angry Men. Oh, really? So it was adapted from like a radio show to film. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think that sort of constrained it in yeah. that way. Yeah, that but it was it took a really visionary director, I think, to be like, this could be a good movie. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I mean, that's great for... for uh, I mean, there's so many things that it, it... Everybody in film would say, you want really visual stuff. Like, you don't... Want, film is made for visual as a visual medium. You don't want a bunch of people on a stage talking that is like a play or a radio show. That's a yeah. different thing. Um, but I think that you can do so many things with film to really make that, uh, to really show the interior life of a character through dialogue. Yeah, it's almost like the more stuff you pull away, like the more things then you'll notice about the character. Like, right. if, the, like if, if these characters were in these really elaborate sets and the set changed every time, it, it would almost be distracting. And then it really focuses, because I remember watching this and like a lot of it is just focused on a character, like really just thinking deeply and having emotions about like, the conversation, you know? Right, exactly. Um, this also makes me think, <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but there's this very weird, I don't even know if it's a movie, I don't know what it is, but it's called uh, Coffee and Cigarettes. Mm. Can you look this up, Kyle, sure. on Wikipedia? It's called Coffee and Cigarettes. It's basically like five short scenes or vignettes, or I don't know what you'd call it, all involving coffee and cigarettes and like a few characters talking. And uh, scroll a little Eleven bit. Eleven short stories. Yeah. I first came across. There's one where Tom Waits and Iggy Pop meet up in a diner, and it just makes no sense. It's like it's like five minutes of them just kind of talking about nothing, and for whatever reason, it like grips me. Mm -hmm. It's like so. It like like there's a, anyways. <laughs> there, there's a, there's like parts in this that make me laugh. Yeah, that make me laugh so hard, and I have no idea why. And it's just like, and then uh, there's another one where Bill Murray and the Wu Tang. Bill Murray is a waiter at a diner, and he has coffee, and he's meeting with two guys from the Wu two guys are dining there from the Wu Tang Clan, <laughs> and they're talking about like health benefits of, or the uh, the health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caf the dangers of caffeine and nicotine. <laughs> it's so weird. It doesn't make any sense. And the conversation, and it's like, and it also it's kind of the style, like older movies used to have much longer pauses between stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's like that. It's slow. Right. Uh, and one of the fun, like there's just so, listening to Tom Waits look at Iggy Pop and go, you like the coffee at IHOP? <laughs> and like making fun of him a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's so awkward and so great. <laughs> Not to mention that's RZA. That's a Steubenville native of Wu-Tang Clan fame right Oh, really? There. Oh, I didn't wow. know that. Yeah, the clan hung out in Steubenville for a little bit when they were first getting started. They moved to New York pretty quick, but they huh. were around the area. I didn't know that. Uh, so you're crowdfunding the movie? I will be. Okay. Uh, it, there's sort of a combination of things 
in the beginning, it'll be sort of bigger philanthropists or distributors that yeah. want to participate. And then after that, we're going to do a crowdfunding campaign. Um, yeah, that's just letting everybody that wants to participate and helping make it and to uh, participate. And like movies, it. I, I mean, is this just a nonprofit movie or is this, I, I mean, is there like a business model behind trying to like, like you're, I guess, obviously trying to break even or is that, or is it just like, no, I'm going to go to donors and they're going to pay and it, it, the making money on it, recouping money on it is not important or yeah, how movies, does that work? Movies are always a risky, really risky investment just in general, even for the biggest people in the industry. Yeah. Um, because they're expensive and because the amount of like, hey, this one is going, it's very hard to predict which ones are going to land. Yeah. Um, but that said, um, I think that for us to have Catholic stories that are being made that are like highly produced and done well, um, economically speaking, people, somebody has to go forward and prove like a model that it, that can work. Okay. And right now, uh, the only person that I know of that has actually made money with a film is Mel Gibson, like a, a you know, a film that's religious mm. since then. So many people have really like fallen on their faces trying to make things, and that's why nothing really happens. Um, and if some if you can prove a model for a way to make money with a film, then you can make more of them. And yep. so for me, uh, I want not just to do this as a. I think it's a very deep, important story to tell, but I also want it to not just break even, but to become the kind of film that you know families watch Catholic families watch as a part of their like Lenten meditations mm -hmm. or, you know, that, uh, are going to be in every bookstore that, uh, that's in Poland or whatever, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think that that is totally doable. And if that is done on a small $250,000 budget, then there will be clear movement. Like, uh, there's, it's like digging a well, you mm -hmm. know, like, now there's going to be other investors and distributors or whatever they're interested and in see, oh, there's potential for really good artistic, like high art mm. done for the Catholic world. Um, right now, there's plenty of stuff that's being made for the Protestant world that uh, goes for those sort of sentiments. It's very like sentimental and uh, just uh, there's a very clear kind of bad guy, good guy thing. And that's great. I think that there's really great space for that. But um, I do think the Catholic world comes out for things that feel a little bit higher art. I don't know what that, why, but, you know, maybe it's because we're all way overeducated and, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> just all liberal arts majors, <laughs> like <laughs> smoking tobacco and yeah, like yeah. criticizing the great literature of the past. So we're all kind of like a little uppity when it comes to like our, you know, story preferences. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think that things that have that kind of character depth um, haven't really been made much uh, yeah. father sue is a good example of something that's like trying to do something a little bit more edgy and and interesting um same with eight beats which we did as short films but yeah this i think i really want to make um both a commercial and a spiritual success would uh, so his father father sue would be a spiritual or a religious movie but would you categorize that in the same place that you'd put like the passion and uh, it's, a, I think that it splits the difference between that and like some of the more evangelical stuff that's going out. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it, cause it, it is it well. a, is it a religious, um, I don't even know the terms, but like, is the, are, are the people making father stew, is that coming from a Catholic organization or is it just a secular? Organ yeah. It's, you know, it's definitely, it's from Marky Mark who's Catholic and no, no, no what Mark I mean is like, um, like, uh, what was that movie about the Christeros war? Mm -hmm. Um, Viva what Cristo Rey, that one? Yeah, yeah. What was it called? Viva Cristo Rey. Yeah, like that was like a Catholic film company, right? That produced I'm, it? I actually don't know much oh, about okay. the genesis of that one. But, okay, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. it was Mel Gibson's wife did the uh, <coughs> Father Stu movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, oh, okay, gotcha. Girlfriend, who gotcha. she has a kid with him. So will the will would your film be in like, like theaters, like at, like theaters? Yeah, we would do a, a release, like a theatrical release. And then part of the way that the ki the Kickstarter campaign will like f funnel into that is that uh, what these kinds of stories need is a grassroots sort of movement under them, groundswell, mm. where 
people in a city are like, we're going to fill a theater. We're taking that on. We're going to be kind of like a street team and we'll like rent out the theater. We'll take on the like sort of physical like burden of that. And then we're going to go and like invite, you know, the whole city out to that yeah. showing. So you build a network of those things all happening in different cities over the course of like, you know, a week or so. Yeah. And when you have that, this is another way that the, the movie movie industry works that opening weekend is when all of the other theaters decide if they're going to take the, you know, to show it again. So the success of a movie has so much to do with opening weekend. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think we Catholics are very slow to stories and things like we're mm -hmm. like, you know, I'll watch that, you know, three months in after somebody tells me that it's worth watching or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's hard to kind of, yeah, it, you, but you have to get that first kind of, impact in order to, to have a movie sort of catch a wave and then go out to uh kind of the bigger audience of yeah. the secular world so that would be how we, like we would hope to make that happen we would do i mean we should do it in grapevine if you guys if there's some way for me to help us rent out i've always wanted to do something at this theater on main street oh yeah dude. i would a thousand percent like i'm not joking like a thousand percent yeah like wherever i need to sign up where i can like we'll we'll film it there or like show it there or whatever. Yeah. Like I would a hundred percent do it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That'd be super it. fun. Yeah. That'd be really fun. Yeah. Everybody awesome. will come out crying. You know, <laughs> that's how it is. But, yeah. uh, Kyle, anything else? Do you have questions? Oh, our recommendations this week. Yeah. We got to do the rest. Explain to, explain to Anthony. So the way the recommendations work, Anthony, is that every episode we give a recommendation. So it can be anything. I, mine are pretty structured. I do an album, a movie and a TV show every week. Going to run on a TV show soon, but we're doing our best. But it can be as simple as a piece of media you really liked. It can be a thing you do, an activity, whatever you want. So okay, I'll lead you go off. first, Kyle. This is what we do at the end of the episode. Yeah, I'll lead off uh, for music. The Rights of Spring self-titled album from 85. One of the real early great emo albums. I think it holds <laughs> up super well. It's not really screamo, but it kind of came out of that. That emotional hardcore to DC. Really, really cool. Movies, uh, Charlie Bartlett, it's this 07 movie. It's got a younger Downey Jr. and this guy Anton Yelchin. He's like a kid who becomes a therapist at his new school, new kid in town, a lot of those tropes. Really fun movie. Downey Jr. plays as like angry principal. He's hilarious in it. And then for shows, uh, Silicon Valley. I think it can be a little repetitive at time. A lot of the seasons feel similar, but overall the core is very funny, especially if you have any interest in the tech scene in any way. Even if you're like, I don't know how to code, I don't want to know how to code, but I like to read the tech section of the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll get the jokes. I've watched a fun. few episodes of, of Silicon Valley. It's very, pretty good. Very, it can be very crass at times, especially yeah. early on. There's like a like a satanic episode that I kind of skipped. Yeah. But definitely take okay, the my, highs and the lows. My rec is going to be to watch the – to go to YouTube and search Coffee and Cigarettes Tom Waits, and you can watch it for free just like that one <laughs> vignette or whatever it is. Uh, that's going to be my recommendation is like, just go somewhere quiet and watch that and then comment on this video, like how weird you found it <laughs> <laughs> or if you enjoyed it. That sounds really fun. Uh, my, mine will be if you are a God parent and you have that little like Catholic guilt going on because you're not <laughs> keeping up with the responsibilities, you know, perfectly. The line in land book club is absolutely a fantastic God parent. Perfect. Gift. Is uh, there a link or a URL for that? Uh, just go to catholic.store and you'll see a banner at the top that sort of introduces it. What about the Colby film? Where can people go to follow along with that or <laughs> it is nowhere yet? There is nowhere okay. online that this is, this is like really early, you know. Okay. Um, so friend request Anthony on Facebook. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, check me out on Instagram uh, at the Dambro. No, uh, yeah, I, if you're interested in that, honestly, social media is the way to get in touch with me. So what year are you estimating that this would come out? Uh, 2024. Okay. In, uh, like, during Lent. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to share with our massive audience? Wow. Uh, just, uh, no, grateful to be here. Um, yeah, it's uh, sometimes I feel like, you know, a little bit of a split personality. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, today there's, like, a little bit of in and out. I was feeling kind of different in the first part of the interview. But I, then, I'll be honest. The first yeah. part of the, the interview or the first part of the episode, it felt a little 
touch and go a little bit, but yeah. I think we really got to well, a good that spot. early bathroom break. You could see on one of the shots you standing up. It's like I, we gotta go pee before the shower. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so what Edmund always tells me, and I never remember. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching this episode of the show. Go to uh, drinkstudiocoffee.com to get all your coffee that you need um, to pretend you're working in a studio. Bye. <laughs> That's good, man. Five, six, That's good. Four, three, two, one. That was fun. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. You're gonna die. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time.